Hello, sci-fi and fantasy fans. My name is Jess, and this is Cam Cat Unwrapped. You've been listening to Karma of the Sun by Brandon Yinkit Bowie, which the Wall Street Journal has described as a thoughtful read, perfect for this moody season. And today we're conducting a remote interview with the author, Brandon Yinkit Bowie. Brandon, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Jess. I'm so glad to be here. Yes, we're so excited to have you. This is our first remote interview too, so hopefully it'll be fun and interesting. Um, first, we would just love to get to know you a little better. Why don't you tell us about yourself? Sure. So I'm the author of Karma of the Sun. Um, I wrote this book about the end of the world from a Tibetan Sherpa's point of view, because at the time I had never seen a book or a movie, uh, about the end of the world told from an Asian, much less a Tibetan perspective. Um, while at the same time being aware that that there is such a rich um, uh, folklore or or tradition about the end of the world, about the creation of the world and the end of the world for that matter, um, in in the East. So I wanted to be able to bring that while asking some, you know, pretty important questions about. Um, you know, individual agency and the power of choice as weight against the collective uh, karma of the world. Absolutely. Well, it is very, very cool. And it was such a fun read. I can't wait to get into it a little more. But just to take a little detour um, to talk about you personally, I read your website a little bit and I saw that you were an intern at Marvel for a bit and you're a lawyer as well. What made you decide to, I mean, first, go on all of these different paths and second, um, write this book yeah my background of 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 career choices and and interests are are kind of eclectic like like my my taste in in fiction for sure uh so i mean starting way back in the beginning i was i was born in california um the son of an oil engineer and um you know moved around growing up very very frequently every three years, moving to a new house, you know, new school. And so uh, that, that um, you know, caused me to have that um, sense that, you know, everything was very transient. Um, and I turned to writing, I turned to books as a way to interestingly, you know, slow down change, slow down time, um, be able to, um, you know, carry characters that I that I um that I came to know in fiction with me from place to place. I spent a lot of time in the libraries as a result, and so I knew from a young age that I wanted to be a novelist. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and so I, I've been writing since I was very little. Um, not just not just stories, but plays and and poetry, and um, <clears throat> you know so. The, the Marvel thing. I was interested in comics at, at one point. I, I um, went to NYU and I studied film there, you know, f- for for a time. Um, <clears throat> but feeling like my 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 voice and my stories were not yet matured, you know, not yet ready. Um, and I and I and I felt like I couldn't yet pursue it, you know, professionally. I guess. Um, so I started doing other things. You know, I, I, I worked in finance, I went to law school, became a lawyer, um, but all along, you know, that, that desire, that interest, that original love, if you will, of, of writing and of stories and words just never left. That was sort of the heart of everything I did was to accumulate these experiences um, to hone that perspective of the world and human nature. Um, felt like carrying around a bag of of rocks, you know, that got heavier and heavier <laughs> until you can unload some of that in this novel. Absolutely. Well, this is definitely a, a really thought provoking story, and it's so clear. I, I think, I mean, to me, it was so clear. I'm sure to our audience as well how much thought and work went into trying to 
center the story around these really heavy themes. And I love what you said earlier about how you were noticing a lot of apocalyptic stories being told uh, from a Western perspective. A lot of them took place in big cities and you don't really see a lot of things, even though there are a lot of there's a lot of lore out there surrounding the apocalypse in Eastern culture. You really don't get to see that. So I think that is very cool that you chose to write your story about that. So I'm so curious. You mentioned that uh, you were with, with Marvel, interested in comics, generally perhaps science fiction leaning as a person. Uh, what's your connection to that? Yeah, great question. <clears throat> um, I, I definitely like, you know, speculative fiction in general. You know, I, I grew up reading science fiction and fantasy. I read a lot of Stephen King when I was younger, uh, hence why I live in Maine now, you know, a, a big a big attraction to that state. But I also read a lot of, well, you know, the classics and, and more literary fiction. <clears throat> I just love the, the beauty of, of the words. And um, my connection to speculative fiction is, I think that I have this, this sense or belief that the world is a lot more mysterious um, than we realize. And um, in that mystery, it, within that mystery are a lot of the deeper truths um, that, you know, often we don't get to dwell on because of the the, the day-to-day um, rigmarole, the illusions of life. Um, so I love that sense of <clears throat> normal everyday setting with a little bit of a speculative element to it. And Karma of the Sun is like that. It's set in you know, near future Tibet, but there are these almost magical elements to it. <clears throat> Some people describe it as you know, uh, magical realism or fantasy. Um, you know, the post-apocalyptic genre is a subgenre of science fiction, but this is not like hard science fiction by, by any means. Um, so yeah, I think that's the, the origin of it. It's just, you know, the, the world and then the layer of the world underneath it. And, and that's, you know, we see that in this book with, with spirits who still haunt the earth, even though that they're, they're dead. Um, and we see a malleability of time and space. Um, and, and uh, yeah, that, that was just kind of a, the zone that I, I like to inhabit in writing. Sure. Yeah. Well, it's so neat. And I was so curious as I was reading because they're, such heavy spiritual, I, I don't even want to say undertones, overtones to the whole story. But yeah, based on uh, the book, I was just so curious what your connection to spirituality is. Yes. Uh, you know, I, I was really struck by how, how similar all these different world traditions are really at the heart of, of what they, what they profess or what they believe. Um, you know, as I mentioned, the end of the world um, and this rich tradition um, that exists in, in, in the East, um, you know, they describe the world ending in these seven apoc apocalyptic suns. <clears throat> well, there are themes of that number seven, you know, that we see elsewhere in the West, the Judeo-Christian, um, you know, uh, religions. But that that was what was most fascinating to me more than the differences or the similarities where you look at, you know, Buddhism, uh, Christianity, Islamism, Zoroastrianism, um, even religions of uh, the Lakota Sioux, for example, or, uh, you know, or, 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 or Hinduism. There are so many amazing similarities. And to me, that is a sign of this shared humanity and a shared, uh, you know, fate of humankind. Um, you, you know, and and that's that's kind of my my that's another area of interest that I'm you know I'm very passionate about. Yeah, I love what you just said about there being so many similarities across different types of cultures and and different lores of different worlds and. Um, Specifically, you know, here you have this book that you've named Karma of the Sun, and, and the word karma has many different meanings across different things, but is so heavily tied to Buddhism and Buddhist traditions and culture. I'm so curious why you chose to name your main character Karma, why you chose to name the book what you did, Karma of the Sun, seems like a little bit of a double entendre because 
you know, it's karma looking for his father. Therefore, he is the son <laughs> and also S-U-N son, of course, because of the way that the apocalypse plays out in your story. I'm curious what your if that was intentional for you. Yeah, yeah, you said it. Uh, absolutely. Um, the title is just sort of, you know, came all of a sudden. Um, and, and for those exact those exact reasons you mentioned, um, you know, karma is, is is a fairly common name um, in that part of the world. Um, but I, I also wanted to play with this sort of um, dual understanding of the word karma. Uh, here in the West, we think of karma as the what goes around comes around uh, definition, which there is an element of that. But in the East, karma is also um, the, 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 the synonym for something else, which is action. And specifically, you know, the power of in, individual action. And there are, there, are other, there, are, there are multiple types of karma. There's the karma that, you know, we do as individuals, but there's also the karma of other people's actions because because we are impacted by those. We're the product of the actions of, of, of other people, both good and bad. Um, you know, think about the decisions of our parents when we're young, um, but also decisions, decisions of absolute strangers that may ripple into our lives. And then there's also the karma of the world, the collective karma. And these people are living in these, you know, dire circumstances through no fault of their own. You know, it wasn't their decision to have a big nuclear war, you know, generations ago, but they are living um, in the in the after effects of that, so just just trying to to you know to propose to to um, posit this question: Can the karma of the son of this of of of, of this boy's father, right? Can his karma outweigh the collective karma of the world? Because that's really what a prophecy is: It's saying if things continue this way. And we have this prophecy in all these different world traditions that say the world is going to end. But what does that say about, first of all, our our freedom? You know, can we really determine our our future and outcome if if there's this prophecy telling you, no, you know what? No matter what you do, you know, the world is going to be destroyed. You know, all of it doesn't matter. Um, and then also the other question of just. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, you know what, 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 what can we, what can we do about it? So, um, you know, I, I, I felt like that, that name, that title, was a big part of the theme. Absolutely. Well, it brings up this really interesting uh, kind of mirror image because talking about, you know, it, what kind of karma is it when, um, you know, if you're being told here is how, what's going to happen, you know you're not really in any control of that, but what do you do moving forward? How do you accept it? Do you live with it? And it kind of brings up this question of, uh, of fate and destiny, you know, and, and the ways that they're kind of entangled in with karma. And I know I was reading a little bit on your website and I know that that's something that you were kind of musing on as you were writing, or I assume because it is one of the book club questions that you've listed out on your website. Is that something that you were musing on when you were writing? How karma and fate are intertwined. Yes, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, how do you reconcile the two? So, if, if we take this, um, y y you know, this reality that we all seem to agree that there was a start um, to the world at some point way back in the beginning. It's how all stories begin, and there's going to be an end, um, as all stories do end. Then. <clears throat> You know, how do you reconcile, um, y you know, this this um, sense of we are kind of the stewards of our own destiny, right? So fate versus destiny. How, which is it? Um, and I and I, and I thought this was an extreme way to raise that question. Also, the other really interesting is um, these people believe in reincarnation in this in this. The, this cast of characters. And so, um, you know, it becomes an even a more provocative question. If the world is destined to end, 
and there is this prophecy that the seventh son is coming and going to eventually destroy what's left of the world to where are you reincarnated if there is no more if the world is gone um it's doubly tragic um and 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 then to raise the not the 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 natural question is well is there any point is there any hope uh in that in that in that case i thought like in in our in our times is an especially relevant question <clears throat> i mean i think many would look at, at the world and 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 see wow we've got a you know we had a global pandemic we had civil unrest we had you know the th we have the threat of nuclear war all all these different kind of scenarios um y you know is any of it too late can we reverse any of that and i and i think this question it takes it in an extreme setting and tr you know tries to tries to explore that sure i i love that perspective and it one of the things that I was curious about and that I'm generally curious about as I've been reading from the perspective of someone who is more on the publishing side now than someone who is just a, a reader is what is the author, what, what message does the author hope that the reader takes away from their story? And a lot of the theme, I mean, the overarching theme that I felt and I, I'm sure many other people felt as they were reading and following along with the story is the sense that this hope never dies, even though uh, the world is ending, there's always this hope. And I'm wondering what was the message that you were hoping your readers would take away and if that is anywhere on on track of that. Yeah, I think that is on track. And you know what's funny, Jess, is when I first started writing this, I I wasn't quite clear how... I saw this, uh, how I saw the world, how I really felt like, um, y you know, what the outcome would be. So I kind of wrote it to the end, got to the to a place which was decidedly more pessimistic, I, I, I guess I would say. And then I took a step back from that and I said, you know, wait a second, I, I don't think I actually believe that. And I kind of had a, an, an epiphany of, of what the end really means. Um, the end is just the beginning. And then also, you know, the, the role of hope. Um, if, there's, if there's still time, um, there's still hope. And going back and rewriting it um, to kind of the version that it is now. Um, so certainly, yes, I, I'm glad that you mentioned that. Um, you know, and, and I've heard from many people that this this was supposed to an, an apocalyptic story that is hopeful and that's different you know and i i'm i'm you know really happy to hear that you know at the same time i feel like there's a little bit of um leaving it open ended to the reader there's some interpretation um you know at the end you're not really sure you know it it, it seems like okay well things are saved but there's always the potential for destruction. And, and that's the truth, I think, in life. In any moment, there's a potential for love or hate, um, for creation and life or destruction. And I, and, I, and I felt like the fact that the mountain, the sanctuary was the same place as the missile silo, um, you know, it's a great symbol of that. Sure, yeah. I also thought that that was very, like just a perfect analogy for everything that, I felt you were trying to encapsulate. So it's very cool to hear that that was kind of your intention as well, because that's definitely what I took away from it. And I love how you said that you'd initially had a much more pessimistic ending and how you kind of looked at that and thought, I don't believe that I need to, to reevaluate. So I'm wondering what other aspects of the story came from either something you've experienced or, or just things based in your real life and your real train of thought and your real belief system even the people, places, events that have happened to you? What other aspects of your life did you include in your story? Yeah, great question. You know, I, I, I feel like as uh, artists, as creators, we draw from, you know, our own lives and our, and our own world. So I'm, I'm, I'm positive that there are things, you know, that, uh, that I, that I've seen or have done or encountered that, you know, influence uh, the shaping of this work. But one thing was this idea of the chosen one. Um, 
you know, thinking about that, that's a sort of, that's a very common trope in a lot of these types of stories, especially when there's a prophecy. And I think I arrived at a very different conclusion that, you know, sometimes there is no chosen one or the chosen one is all of us. I think there's a line that says we are all the sons and daughters of, of um, you know, the Buddha. And I think the, you know, the, the point is that at some point during the story, there was a little bit of a, of a question of who is the chosen one, right? There's this prophecy that there's go going to be this reincarnated Lama who's going to lead them um, once they, once they, and teach them once they arrive at this mountain sanctuary. Um, and, and then, you know, something happens to that person. And then the question is who, well, what now? Is it, is it all over? Um, and I, and I think it's often people like karma. He's a completely normal, average person, young person with very little experience, 17 years old. And in fact, he's probably in a way at the beginning of the story, less than average because, you know, he has confidence issues. He's missing this big part of his, his past, which is his relationship with his father. He's told that he's cursed. He's told that his father is a really bad guy. And he's told the world's going to end and that nothing matters. So all this is weighing on him and he, and he believes it. And he has absolutely, and he, he should believe it because there's no other reason to think of it any other way. But, but then something happens and, and that is that he has this desire completely separate from all this, which is to see his father one last time before the end of the world. And that very pure, that very, um, you know, innocent desire to, to do that, to set out, even despite it being the eve of the apocalypse, to find his father is what ultimately changes the fate of the world. And because he wants something, he creates hope for himself without even knowing it. And, and in addition to that, because he now has hope, other people have hope because they look to him and see, well, here's somebody that's doing something. Let's follow him. Let's help him. And so to answer you know, your question of drawing from my, my life, you know, I've found people who have stepped in to help me, you know, some people um, who have surprised me how much that they've you know, that they've wanted to help me, who have been instrumental in my life. Um, and I think often it's because, you know, they saw someone who was maybe younger or maybe less experienced or less skilled at something. And they're heroes too. You know, they're, they're the chosen one in their way. And we, we all are. This is, this is our story. I really love that. That is really, really cool. I love how you bring up the power of ordinary people. Anyone can be the chosen one. And I love what you were saying before, too, about how just by karma deciding that this is his desire, that was enacting karma on itself because he affected the people around him who wanted to help him and and how beautiful that is, how cyclical and how that builds and grows. And I also like what you said about his desire to see his father equaling his hope and how those kind of tie in together. And, and that is very, very cool. I want to shift gears a little bit just because I'm so curious about I, as much as I love talking about the story and having all of these philosophical little tidbits that we get to add in. I'm so curious about your writing process for this, because you did mention earlier that you got through to the end of the book, realized that you didn't believe in the ending, didn't, like the ending and went back and rewrote it. Do you feel like you are more of a planner? So had you planned out to the end of the book and then started writing and realized you didn't like it? Or do you feel like you're more of the term that has been used around here as a pantser? Like you just kind of let the story tell you, oh yeah, <laughs> right off the bat, you already know a pantser. <laughs> No, no, no. I knew I knew you were going to say pantser, so I I was saying, but, but my my answer to that question is is kind of a hybrid. I I think, um, I approach writing the way I like I like to approach like you know travel or trips, which is I do like to plan. I do like to do research, so I know you know where I'm going. Um, look at maps. Look at things that I definitely 
would like to see, but then when I get there, I kind of throw I throw it out um, so that I have the general sense of the lay of the land, but then I give myself the freedom to explore it once I'm there. So I'm not like looking down at the map or the travel guide the whole time, but kind, kind of look up and look around. It took me a little while to get there, you know, definitely more in the beginning, more of a you know, maybe this is a lawyer side, you know, more of an outliner, a planner, have everything sort of categorized and then feeling like, okay, this is great, but I, I'm feeling a little, the characters are feeling a little bit constrained. You know, they have minds of their own as well. And um, I had to slowly learn to, to let go. So I've kind of landed in a much more um, fluid hybrid uh, approach. Sure. That's funny that you mentioned that being your travel style. I, I resonate with that very much. Um, so to again, I, just because I really loved what you said about um, how you changed the ending from what you initially thought it was going to be. So I'm very focused on that right now. It's just so interesting to me. Do you feel like that was your hardest scene to write, the ending? The ending was quite hard. Um, you, you've mentioned a couple of things. You said cyclicality, you mentioned a mirror. Um, and then th that's the way the story's shape came to be. You know, it start, starts out with, it was a bad omen. And then there's a yak and, and all these things. And the ends out, this is a good omen. And I, I love sort of the mirror um, shape of the story, the duality, that's right. And I love that the terminal point starts it off at the beginning of another story and it kind of loops back um so um yeah i i i was i had to free myself to be open to constantly making changes and it's just this <laughs> um you know talk about duality this feeling of like when you get to the end each draft like yes you know i i feel like i really understand the story now i know what i have to change and being like oh no i have to start all over again <laughs> and going back you know uh, over and over again but um in some ways it it lends to this layered feeling of the world you know this layered texture where i feel like that change and that um that push and pull um gave the world a, a little you know, the, the world building, building a little um, sense of um, real life because there are different shades and things are often not simple and there isn't just one plot thread, but but many. Um, so in some ways that helped the, the story. Sure. Well, being that there are so many layers to the story, uh, did you have to do a lot of research to inform your writing or was a lot of it just musings that you had kind of come to on your own and wanted to include in your story? Yeah, a little bit of both. De definitely musings of my own, but, you know, um, having spent some time in that part of the world, I drew from that, from my own travels, but also reading a lot of the primary sources that I cite to in the book, you know, the Pali canon that describes the the earth's apocalyptic fate um the lotus sutra that describes um the seeing stone um and and other you know other sources um to to really you know derive inspiration for for one thing because there's so much there um and also um you know just, just learn more about the setting Sure, that makes sense. Have you been to Tibet? I've been to the area. I haven't been to the Tar, the Tibetan Autonomous Region. It's kind of a restricted, you know, area in terms of travel uh, these days. But certainly to the areas around it, um, in in northern China and western China, you know, right outside of Tibet, um, I have you know backpack went backpacking through it, and um, and things like that. Oh, wow. That is so cool. Well, I'm going to shift gears again a little bit because uh, one thing I'm always so curious about, and for you especially, I don't even know if you've had an opportunity to listen to your audiobook yet since, you know, everything has come out so recently. Your book really did 
it, within this within 2023 it dropped. So um, it, this is the quickest we've ever had a book come out on in like as a Cam Cat has published a book and now we have it on the podcast, which is very exciting for me because I feel like I get to kind of strike while the iron is hot with you. Um, but what was that like for you, both if you've gotten a chance to listen to your audiobook in totality, um, what it was like to hear your own words read, read back to you and what it was just the whole experience was like casting the narrator and all of that. What was that experience like for you? Yeah, that that was like one of the highlights of my entire life, you know, just hearing a professional voice actor bring something that you've written to life. Um, you know, you mentioned the audition that that was a, such a neat experience to have CamCat, you know, send me, I think it was like five or six audio files and they they each read the same portion of chapter one. And hearing them with their, you know, their beautiful radio voices, you know, come on um, and, and, and you know, breathe life into these words was was amazing. It was completely mesmerizing to to listen to. I, I'd play it to friends, and you know, it, it's it was uh, just such a fun, memorable experience. Um, but Kyung Sim, the narrator of the audiobook, did a phenomenal job. He was so good. Um, I just love his, you know, his delivery and um, how he did the voices, how he kind of, you know, speaks um, you know, the description, like breeds a description into the, into the story, you know, has such a subtle um, approach and delivery. And a lot of it was surprising to me, you know, a lot of the way he emphasized certain things um, his rhythm of the speech was different than how I would have done it, but the way he does it makes it feel uh, alive um, and makes it feel like somebody telling a, you know, in some ways a totally different story, same story, but a different story, which made it very exciting um, as the as the writer um, to absorb. Sure. Well, I, I can imagine did it sound anything like how you imagined it in your head or do you feel like it was just a completely different telling of your story? No, it did. I, I think it did. Oh, and good. <laughs> oh, that's yeah. so great. Yeah. I, I mean, it's, it's some, someone who, who likes film and I, I studied screenwriting. Um, you know, you've, you have a script and it can read really great, but to have, you know, great talented actors um play these characters um it's sort of a similar thing well speaking of your film and screenwriting uh experience that is a perfect segue into my next question the next couple questions i love to ask all of our authors just because i'm so curious uh, although i'm going to ask you what if your book was going to be made into a movie who you would cast and what you kind of envision that looking like although I just want to say sometimes I read books that I just think are so lovely and, and just capture so much nuance in written word um, and so many subtleties in written word that I almost feel like uh, I, I wouldn't want to see a movie of it because I just love how it lives in my head. But I'm so curious what you would imagine for the movie of the movie version of Karma. I, I do love movies and I, and I think this, this would be phenomenal to see on the screen uh, because of the the landscape, um, it, you know, the epic quality of the story. Uh, but you know, going back to your first question, I think it would be amazing to see Michelle Yeoh as the character of the nun. Um, she she's been someone that I, I I've I've really liked you know from even before Crouching Tiger and Hidden Dragon, and and of course everything now, um, but uh, you know just how cool would that be, <laughs> as far as as far as you know a casting choice. Absolutely. Oh, I could totally see that. Well, that is uh, a a great answer, <laughs> um, and. Going back a little bit to something you said long, long, long time ago, um, we were talking a little bit about the cyclical nature of your story, how 
the end of it also felt like the beginning of the next story. So I'm so curious, do you plan on writing a sequel for your next book or do you have other novels in store? Because this is your debut novel, right? It is. It is the debut novel. And yes, I I, I do. Um, I'm currently working on two, two projects, um, but I think the one uh, I, I'm leading more towards investing as you know, more time is the second novel from here is one that is also uh, based in Asia. Um, it told from the point of view of the Chinese god of theater uh, and set in pre-World War II uh, Shanghai, um, another speculative uh, fiction type of story. But yeah, that's that's what I'm working on next. Oh, that is so neat. Well, I'm excited to to delve into that a little bit more at a later time. I hope that I eventually comes across our CamCat desk when you're done with it. Uh, before we get going, Brandon, where can our audience find you? Yes, they can find me on Instagram at Bowie Books. Um, that's B-O-E-Y-B-O-O-K-S. Um, or on Twitter, at Brandon YK Bowie or at my website at Brandon com. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for coming on with us. This is such a fun interview and I'm so glad I got to ask some of my burning questions. Well, thanks for having me, Jess. I really appreciate this and enjoyed it as well. Oh, I'm so glad. Yes. And your answers just completely, uh, quenched my thirst for them as well. So thank you so much. And to the listeners at home, you can find Karma of the Sun in audiobook, ebook, and print formats on our website, camcatbooks.com or wherever books are sold. And make sure you follow us on social media at camcatbooks. Thank you guys so much for tuning in and unwrapping another one of our books to live in with me. My name is Jess, and I'll see y'all next time here on Camcat Unwrapped.